3.5 million square kilometers of aquatic territory, trillions of dollars in natural resources, seven countries, Brunei, China, Malaysia, the Philippines, Taiwan, Vietnam, and the United States, all with overlapping and mutually exclusive claims. This is a recipe for war. Is it a good idea for these countries to have submarines, warships, and fighter jets always on patrol? Is World War III only a matter of time? In this video, we'll dissect the tangled mess of claims surrounding the South China Sea. Before we do, we'd like to take a quick moment to thank this video's sponsor, Aura. As you all know, we make political content here and on our other channels. Unfortunately, that means some people don't like us very much. These days, a quick Google search is all it takes to find someone's personal information. Data brokers sell your information to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you. Your full name, email, home address, health records, your relatives, it's all readily available for those who want to find it. That's why I've been using Aura to help keep my private details private. Aura shows me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. This not only cuts down on the amount of spam I get, but also helps keep all my accounts safe from bad actors. And Aura does so much more. It's a VPN, a password manager, an antivirus. It even offers identity theft insurance and parental controls. And the best part is, it's all in one place and very reasonably priced. So if you're like me and you value your privacy and staying safe online, visit Aura.com slash first thought and get your first two weeks absolutely free, no strings attached. Try it out and I promise you'll appreciate the peace of mind. Support the show and protect your valuable data by signing up today at the link below. The dispute lies at the center of many simmering conflicts between regional powers, with the exception, as always, of the United States. Fishing rights, oil and gas drilling, and the strategically valuable islands might as well all be one super resource, as what happens to one drastically affects the others. The South China Sea is located south of China, southeast of Vietnam, and west of the Philippines. It contains three main land features, the Spratly Islands, the Paracel Islands, and the Scarborough Shoal, all of which have strategic value to the countries the South China Sea borders, as well as the United States. Geopolitical power and the ability to be an influential player in the region and indeed the world is predicated on control over all or part of the maritime territory. Let's examine the natural resources of the South China Sea, one of the largest factors contributing to its immense importance in the region. First, it boasts a diverse range of marine species, containing one-third of all biodiversity on the planet, which allows for a lucrative fishing industry that accounts for 10% of the world's catch. That's all well and good, but this economic cornucopia has also resulted in a tremendous ecological disaster, with findings showing 40% of fishing stocks are collapsed or overexploited, and 70% of the coral reefs are heavily depleted. Moving from one unsustainable practice to another, the second is a pair of resources, oil and natural gas. Natural gas is the more abundant of the two with an estimated yield of 266 trillion cubic feet, and it makes up 60 to 70% of the hydrocarbon resources in the region. Its oil reserves, by comparison, are rather modest, with proven reserves clocking in at 7.7 .7 billion barrels, although optimistic estimates put the number as high as 213 billion barrels. Either way, it's profitable, and will therefore probably be fueling your car soon. Last, but definitely not least, is its importance to trade. Approximately $3.4 trillion worth of trade passes through the South China Sea, and accounts for one-third of global shipping. Between this and the fact that 64% of its trade depends on it, China considers this sea vital to its economy and overall security. However, similar claims are made by the other countries in the region, which unsurprisingly has contributed to rising tensions, both historically and today. Speaking of the past, let's look at some background context with a very brief overview of how important trade in the South China Sea has been historically. This body of water has been vital to trade for a very long time, dating back to the 7th century CE. It facilitated communication, cultural exchange, and the trade of commodities. Fast forwarding to the mid 20th century, China seized the Paracel Islands from the now extinct South Vietnam in 1974. These islands are important primarily for their fishing grounds and their strategic location just 200 nautical miles from China's Hainan Island province. 
20 years later, in 1994, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which establishes a legal framework for all maritime activities, established the international boundaries for territory, economic zones, and continental shelves. This was an adequate start, but it didn't solve enough of the lingering territorial disputes. So in 2002, China and member states of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations agreed on a non-binding Declaration on the Conduct of Parties in the South China Sea, which essentially affirms a commitment to peaceful passage through the South China Sea, as well as mandating that members resolve disputes diplomatically, and it lays out a host of cooperation agreements on specific resources and exploration. In 2009, China responded to a joint submission by Malaysia and Vietnam to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf by submitting a map containing the Nine Dash Line, and claimed approximately 90% of the area of the South China Sea as Chinese territory. With such an expansive claim, one that strongly conflicts with those of several other countries, we need to dive into the different claims and what they're based on. Before we begin, just a quick note about Taiwan. Taiwan's claims are identical to that of the People's Republic of China, and based on the same evidence, so to avoid repetition, we won't give them their own section. With that out of the way, we'll begin with the People's Republic of China. The PRC's claim actually goes back thousands of years. They assert that their ancestors were the first to discover the islands in the South China Sea, and that Chinese governments throughout the ages have exercised continuous jurisdiction, including economic development, over the SCS and the islands it contains. They also assert that not once during that time had their sovereignty over the SCS islands been challenged, until relatively recently. The islands under discussion are the Paracel and Spratly Islands. We already mentioned where the Paracel Islands are located, but where are the Spratly Islands, and why are they important? Located north of insular Malaysia, and roughly halfway between the Philippines and Vietnam, and spread out over a massive 409,000 square kilometers, China's interest in the islands is based on the available resources, such as large oil and gas deposits and fishing. They have strategic military value to China as well, evidenced by the construction of military facilities including airstrips, radar systems, and naval bases. Clearly, China sees these islands as a way to project power in the region. The aforementioned map with the Nine Dash Line has its roots in a map drawn by a Chinese cartographer in 1936, which Taiwan adopted in 1947 and the PRC adopted in 1949. It caused quite a stir at the time when China used the map in an official territorial assertion, and is still a point of serious contention that the other claimant nations reject out of hand. China claims 90% of the area, so let's look at the map a bit closer and see for ourselves what possible issues this might cause. Here's China's Nine Dash Line in red. And now, here are all the Exclusive Economic Zone, or EEZ, boundaries for all the countries bordering the SCS as defined by UNCLOS. Let's first note all the intersections between the Nine Dash Line and the EEZs of the other countries. Two intersections with Vietnam's borders, two intersections with Malaysia's borders, two intersections with Brunei's borders, and one intersection with the Philippines' border. Now let's see all the intersections that are only between countries other than China. Vietnam's border intersects Malaysia's border twice, Brunei's border twice, and the Philippines' border twice. Malaysia's border, besides Vietnam, intersects Brunei's border twice, and the Philippines once. The only two countries whose borders do not intersect are Brunei and the Philippines. It should be pretty clear that, while China is making an expansive claim, they don't account for all the complexity in the region. We can see that when the Nine Dash Line is removed, there remain several border disputes of which China is not a party, and the big player becomes Vietnam. Now, let's move on to the claims of the other countries except the border overlaps. We'll focus only on the specific landmasses claimed. We'll start with the smallest country in the region, Brunei. Brunei specifically claims a reef known as the Luisa Reef, which is located in the Spratly Island archipelago. These islands, according to Brunei, fall within their defined portion of the continental shelf as well as their EEZ. This reef is valuable mostly due to its amazing biodiversity, which fuels thriving tourism and fishing industries, and provides abundant subjects for pharmaceutical research. Next, we'll look at Brunei's neighbor, Malaysia. Malaysia claims Swallow Reef, which it's controlled since the 1983 occupation, and Amboina Cay, which Vietnam controls, both of which are part of the Spratly Islands, and all of which are claimed by China. The legal basis for Malaysia's claim comes from a continental shelf law from 1966, a 1979 map, and their joint submission to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf in 2009. Along with Brunei, Malaysia also claimed Louis Arif, 
But in 2009, the two countries entered into an agreement regarding the reef, which to this day has not been made public. Despite the secretive nature of the agreement, the conflict seems to have been solved to the satisfaction of both parties. Next, we'll move northeast to the Philippines. The Philippines claims the Scarborough Shoal, as well as a northeastern group of the Spratly Islands known as the Kalayan Island Group. The basis for their claim on Kalayan is based on an assumption that after Japan renounced their claim to the island in the 1951 Treaty of Peace, they reverted to a legal state known as terra nullius, which means land that is legally unoccupied or uninhabited. They go further in their assertion that Filipino explorer Tomas Cloma declared ownership over 33 features in the Spratly Islands in 1956, and therefore no other country has a legitimate claim to them. As for the Scarborough Shoal, they claim it passed to them via Spanish and US colonial territorial claims, and that they inherited the Scarborough Shoal after gaining full independence from the US. Finally, we'll move west to Vietnam. Vietnam claims sovereignty over all or most of both the Paracel and Spratly Islands. These claims are based on Vietnam's occupation of the islands since the 17th century, as well as documents from the era that prove as much. The earliest of these documents dates from 1686, titled Route Maps from the Capital to the Four Directions. The other document Vietnam points to comes from an 1838 map called The Complete Map of the Unified Dai Nam, which illustrates both island chains with lines that indicate ownership by Vietnam. During French colonization, these island groups were administered as part of Vietnam, and control of the islands was transferred upon France vacating the country. Vietnam also claims that the 50 nations attending the San Francisco Conference all recognized, without objection, their sovereignty over the Paracel and Spratly Islands. Vietnam asserts that, at some point between the 70s and the modern day, China used force to expel Vietnam and occupied the islands themselves. However, the lack of specifics regarding this particular claim raised questions as to its authenticity. Now that we know the players, their claims, and their evidence, let's look at the recent developments including the pivot the US has made in their Asia strategy. Most of the recent news you're likely to have seen regarding the South China Sea has involved warships and fighter jets from China and the US interacting with each other in some way. But those aren't the only tense encounters in the South China Sea. Recently, it's mostly been the interactions between Filipino citizens and the Chinese military which have generated the most headlines, aside from those involving the US. These encounters, while tense, haven't resulted in any violent responses from either side. Aside from the conference regarding the continental shelf, not much in the way of formal diplomacy has taken place recently, and the issue has seemed to recede into the background as other, more dire problems have come to the fore. This hasn't stopped the US from pivoting its Asia strategy to combat what it sees as Chinese aggression in the region. It does this without any acknowledgement of the legitimacy of China's territorial claims, instead resorting to warmongering at home, laundered through the dutiful US media. Countless headlines over the past few decades claim that China's on a war footing, and that various invasions are imminent, and that the US must, for nebulous reasons, intervene to protect the region from the menace of the evil CCP. Note the unwillingness to use the universally recognized correct name, the CPC. This is very plainly an attempt to get Americans to make a negative association between China and the US's last geopolitical rival. This pivot and strategy began during the Obama regime, and is, unsurprisingly, centered around military objectives. Obama increased troop numbers in Australia, added naval response capabilities in Singapore, and worked to increase US presence in the Philippines. Despite China being cast as the aggressive bad guy, it should be noted that US military activity and stationing of tens of thousands of troops in the region is not for the maintenance or protection of claims to territories in the SCS or surrounding regions, but to buoy US allies in the region. Obama claimed that there were other considerations. The so-called pivot was meant to address democracy in the region, the security of resources for allies to benefit the US, and to balance the influence of China though how the US being involved achieves this balance isn't explained. Overall, the pivot looks like nothing more than an elaborate intimidation campaign aimed at China on behalf of US allies whether they asked for it or not. Given all the tensions, territorial conflicts, and the mere involvement of the United States, it would appear that the region is destined for war, with its future very much depending on the relationship between the US and China given their size, military power, and nuclear capabilities. Geopolitical foreign policy interests overlapping with economic incentives have resulted in a tense situation that only good diplomacy can solve, which the United States has never been particularly fond of. The interests of capital cannot be allowed to supersede the cause of peace, or the health of this critical biome. In the meantime, all normal people can do is get organized, 
We need to be ready for whatever the future brings, and building dual power structures now is one step towards creating a better world. Episodes like this one are made possible thanks to our generous patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to help support the show, and get some great perks while you're at it, consider becoming a patron. Perks include access to our Discord server, early access to videos, ad-free episodes, and more. You can help us keep the channel afloat by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash firstthought. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.